What have we been trying to do? We've been trying to really improve student outcomes um, along with the student experience. And I think it's really important to understand what is most important to us. Um, everything that we do is student-centric. Um, one would think that that's the way it always is in higher ed, but I think all of you on the call know that's not always the case. So we always put the, the student at the center of the table, at the center of every discussion we have, to try to um, be sure that what we're doing is, in fact, in the student's best interest. Uh, everything we do is data informed, not just impressions. We want to be sure that, that what we're doing is, is hitting the target. Um, we believe in evidence-based practices and, and, and try to really base what we do on, on what works. Um, as I mentioned in the introduction, we, we use a lot of predictive analytics um, to ensure that we're putting our resources where they will be most beneficial. And then finally, based upon my academic background, um, we try to use a public health population health model in terms of segmenting students and understanding our interventions and, and how we go about this. So we started this work um, quite a while ago and, and really started uh, through the Division of Undergraduate Education focusing on the four-year graduation rate, focusing on the quality of the experience, something that really, to be honest, wasn't done at Stony Brook um, and, and isn't done at many research universities. Uh, and then in, in 2014, our then president of the university, Samuel L. Stanley, Jr., uh, participated in a White House conference um, talking about completions and, and academic success with President Obama and, and Mrs. Obama. Um, and he announced at the conference that Stony Brook would achieve a 60% four-year graduation rate by the year 2020. Um, that was quite a stretch goal for us. Um, of course, we embraced it. Um, but we knew that that would be really difficult for us to do, but we were up to the challenge. And we, we decided we would, well, we didn't have a choice, to be honest. I was going to say we decided to take it on. Um, and we moved forward. And we continued what we were doing, and, and we upped our game a, along the way. At, at this point, um, when we started this, our, our graduation rate was really in, in um, about 47%. So this, this would have me meant a very significant uh, rate increase to get to 60% by 2020. In fact, based upon all the interventions that we've done, we were able to get up to 64% in 2015 and 76% for our six-year graduation rate. So we actually increased our grad four-year graduation rate 17 percentage points in six years, which is quite a, an increase and something we're really proud of. But even more significant, uh, I think, is, is looking at, at what this means to students. So this means that an additional 1,800 students were able to graduate on time from the university. They were able to begin their lives. They were able to go on to graduate school, or they were able to um, start to join the, the job market or, or one of the service organizations. And at the same time, that meant $125 million potential monetary benefit to these students. $24 million were saved that they were no longer paying tuition and fees, which, of course, was not good news to our university necessarily, but in the student's best interest. And the other $101 million was their additional earning capacity by leaving school on time and being able to earn that kind of money. More important um, than just the simple 17% increase in, in our four-year graduation rate is that we've been able to essentially eliminate um, most of the disparities that all of our higher education institutions are, are dealing with and have been working on trying to mitigate. So we've been able to um, really close, if not eliminate, the, the racial gap between students of color and, and white students, and we've been able to eliminate um, the gap between Pell-eligible students and more affluent students. And you can see on the chart um, that the difference between the four-year and six-year and, and the progress we've been able to make. 
The one gap that, that we've not been successful at, at, at decreasing is the gender-based gap between um, male students and female students, um, and we'll get to talk about that uh, as a separate initiative at, at the end of, of this presentation. Some folks um, assume that because our in institution has become more competitive, because um, we are admitting students with, with higher credentials, that that's why all of these rates have, have improved, when in fact we can show through the data that only 5% of that increase is attributable to the profile of the incoming students. So while it does make a difference, um, the vast majority of what we've been able to accomplish is based upon the work that, that we've done through the academic success team, which we're going to hear about, and, and the, the vision of undergraduate education. So we have a broad-based academic success team. Uh, up until the pandemic now, we've been meeting every week. Um, we meet actually, and I think this is interesting, we meet at um, 7.30 in the morning, um, and we fill a conference room with people. We, we do it at, at 7.30 in the morning because no one can tell me that they have another meeting scheduled. Um, I haven't tried to do it since we've been, we've been working remotely, but we will get back to it at some point. What we've tried to do is take a, a full 360 degree review of all of our policies, all of our procedures that impact student success, understand why we, we've done them, um, what, the, what the motivation is, are they really contributing to student success, um, why were they put in place in, in the first place, and do they still need to be there? Um, they could be, you know, have been there for, for the last 30 years. Um, we want to make sure that, in fact, this is something that is, is helping students to, to move forward. And we've been able to, to make significant change in some really important policies and procedures that the university has. You can look at on the slide. I'm not going to read through um, all of the representation. But you can see that we have a really uh, broad-based group of, of people who are, are represented at this meeting. These are high-level people who are, are empowered to make decisions and, and move forward. Uh, and we really appreciate everybody coming together and, and bringing what their offices and their areas have to bear on, on uh, really improving student success and, and moving this along. I'm going to turn it over to, to Shelley now, who, who's going to talk about the, the way that we approach change and what our, our change model actually is. Hi, everyone. So as Charlie mentioned, I'm going to spend the next few minutes talking about uh, both the methodology and also the action items uh, specifically that we applied. Um, you know, out of the academic success team in particular. So, um, so if you, um, on this particular slide here, um, methodologically the academic success team really applied the PDSA cycle for learning and improvement. And for um, folks that may not be familiar with that, this is a model that was developed by Arthur Deming, I think uh, most notably used by the auto industry. I think in the education world you can really think about this model as a way for identifying good practices, essentially. Um, but the framework uh, is great because it really allows for trying things without getting stuck in immediate perfection um, because there is an iterative and reiterative process. So it really allows for immediate action. So essentially this is a framework for designing, testing, implementing change, and continuous improvement. Um, so uh, the idea here is that it is iterative, it is problem solving, it lets you look at a problem, study it, make the change, evaluate it, um, and then either continue with it uh, or change it based on, on the uh, reflection and iteration. And so this is something that the academic success team was able to apply methodologically um, under Charlie's leadership and really allowed for the uh, development and discovery and implementation of good practices uh, for some of the strategies that we were able to apply. And so I'm going to spend some time talking about those strategies because I think the actionable items, um, and, and Rick's going to follow up uh, on, on some uh, more specific ones, but, uh, but I think the actionable items are really uh, what, what 
some people may be interested in as far as what you can do or maybe what you can expand on based on what you're already doing. Um, so we really engaged in a multi-pronged pronged approach leading to improvements. It's a combination of different strategies that drove better outcomes. And I think Charlie mentioned this in the beginning, but um, it really was not just one way. There was no silver bullet necessarily. It was a full court press on uh, strategies that we know, um, based in the data, have proven better outcomes. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some of them. So Charlie had already mentioned academic success team. Another really important component uh, to our success work, and you can actually see this in the representation listed uh, uh, from academic success team, uh, is our institutional research team. I want to give significant credit to Braden Hosh, who's our associate VP for that area, and his team. It's a very robust area, uh, and the expansion of their role uh, in success work, as well as the mission of their work in success in the success work, has really been uh, instrumental. And that has played directly into our ability to use analytics and the statisticians and the uh, data visualization experts uh, that he has and the team that he has there have really. Uh, allowed us to leverage uh, the data that we've needed to move some of these things forward. Um, so, for instance, related to analytics, they've done a lot of work for us, both uh, related to in-house analytics with predictive modeling, which has been really important so that we can identify uh, students who may need additional support sooner. Um, we have also been able, just related to uh, institutional research, have really been able to utilize some of their uh, data visualization expertise uh, to, to be able to push out uh, data uh, to folks on the ground. I think that's really important, and I think any opportunity that institutions have to put uh, data, to create data accessibility um, into people's hands is critical. Uh, it influences outreach efforts, uh, and it can help the development of outreach strategy um, on the ground. And I always say that, um, that that's really um, important. And Rick's going to talk a little bit more about how those outreach efforts influence specifically to finish in four right after this. Um, but I did want to mention that the analytics on the ground is, is critical. Um, we've also been able to use third-party analytics. And, and for, for instance, I think some folks are using different third-party analytics platforms. We use uh, EAB Navigate, um, including the mobile app. And this platform has really been a tool for the way that we can engage with students to try to coordinate our support. Uh, so that level of coordination has also been important. Um, a few other things that I want to mention, um, one in particular is around policy reform. So as Charlie mentioned, for Academic Success Team, we did take a 360-degree look um, around uh, policies and practices. There's a few things that came out of this, in particular uh, related to registration. So the expectation that we were communicating to students around registration, uh, advanced registration enrollment, as well as the number of credits that, uh, that students really uh, need to take in order to advance in four years. So, so changing the expectations around that became really important, um, and as well as reviewing some administrative barriers. And the one that I always talk about that I, I in some ways, I think is a little bit of low-lying fruit is reviewing any barriers in your degree clearance process. Um, we took a long look at the way that we were doing degree clearance and the kinds of barriers that existed to students both at the system level but also is in the um, administrative level. Uh, and taking a look at that has actually allowed us to move students through in a different way. And I, I think has really just that, clearing those barriers away, can be really profound. Um, segmentation has also been really important for us. So uh, when we talk about segmentation, it's really giving additional outreach consideration to certain groups. Um, for us, Charlie will talk about this more, uh, it's male students. We also looked at students uh, in the murky middle with the GPAs, particularly around the 2.0 and 2.5 range, and those that were behind in credits. And Rick's going to talk about how we leveraged those groups uh, specifically through our, our Finish in Four initiative. Um, two other things that I want to talk about before I pass it on to Rick. Um, one is the way that we also had to look at courses. 
uh, as part of our success work. So uh, course-based information became really important. Uh, where were the bottlenecks? What courses were available? What courses were students getting blocked out of? And, and how would we be able to make some changes related to that, um, both with different kinds of modalities to support students, um, but also with uh, funding. We've been really fortunate um, to have funding out, uh, of, you know, leadership support from the provost and the president um, to be able to uh, to uh, add courses uh, when, in fact, we have identified that there may be an immediate need. Um, so that's been really critical. Um, also identifying high DFW classes, uh, what were those classes, and what kinds of changes uh, might uh, be made related to those classes, like what is really going on there, um, and how can different uh, opportunities exist to support students to kind of change uh, the success culture within those classes. And the most important way to do that is by engaging the academic departments and the faculty. So engaging faculty and the academic departments in the success work, particularly around the course level information, uh, became really critical. And then the final thing I just want to mention is our Academic Success and Tutoring Center. Uh, we uh, created uh, several years ago a more robust, uh, centralized uh, academic success and tutoring center that offers both course-based and skill-based tutoring, peer academic success coaches, supplemental instruction. Um, it's incredible because by the third week, appointments are full, um, and so we are still trying to add capacity to that. Um, but fortunately, we were recently able to sign on with uh, STAR New York, which is in part supported by uh, SUNY, the State University of New York, for online tutoring service. Um, so in some ways, we were, we were applying kind of a virtual format before we really had to go virtual uh, with everything that's been going on. Um, but that has expanded opportunities for students, but still provides uh, on-campus support um, through that, that online setting. So, so those are really the, the fundamental action items uh, that we were able to, to dig into and, and to apply as part of our strategies. Um, Rick's going to talk more specifically about the Finish It in Four initiative, which included uh, a dedicated retention specialist and advising strategist. That's why I'm not going to touch specifically on advising, but I do want to mention um, just how critical advising is uh, to our success work and the way in which advising strategy uh, has really changed, I think, uh, the course of our ability to interact and support students. So I'm going to turn it over to Rick now so that he can talk more specifically about Finish in Four and some of our advising initiatives. Okay, great. Thank you, Shelley. Um, so you've now heard some of the elements of what we call the secret sauce. And what I thought would be helpful is to talk a little bit more in detail about Finish in Four and specifically kind of give a snapshot in time of how as a team we work together um, to look at our population from a cohort-specific model. And so as you look to the left on, on the screen in front of you, you'll see that we talk about the class advisors and then how we look to improve the retention rates um, between first, second, second, and third, and third, and fourth years. And as you see on the, on the graph there, our first to second year retention rate over the, the last 16-year period had typically been fairly strong, very high. This is in part, as Charlie is the dean of undergraduate colleges, and in Shelley's prior role as well, overseeing the undergraduate colleges, that, um, that first year initiative has been really important in maintaining a high first to second year retention rate. So we've hovered typically around 90% in the last four or five years. But as you can see from the chart, we had seen pretty large drops between the second and third and third and fourth year. So a lot of our focus was on how do we retain students from the sophomore to junior year and junior to senior year. And so, as Charlie mentioned earlier, when the commitment was, was made to the White House to increase our four-year graduation rate, we knew that it was in the later years that we needed to put a lot of attention. And so just to give you a little bit of a the snapshot of how we worked with, at that time, the cohort of what we call the class of 2018, we looked at students who entered their sophomore year in the fall of 2015 and did a lot of collective work in saying, how can we impact this particular group of students? And for Stony Brook at the time, it was a group of about 2,800 students entering their sophomore year that we put a lot of effort into. As Shelly mentioned, we did have um, resources to hire Finish and Four professional advisors, so that helped. We also hired some graduate students to help as well. Um, as Shelly mentioned earlier, the institutional research aspect was critically important because we needed from that list, that, that Excel spreadsheet of all the students in that sophomore year, we wanted to look at how can we most 
be most impactful and most deliberative in the steps that we take to influence their ability to stay at Stony Brook and succeed. And so there are several things that we did during that time. Um, one of them really included the advising, the outreach part was very important. Um, we also looked at institutional research data in particular, looking at um, predictive analytics related to high school GPA. We knew from prior years that if a, if a student had at least a 93 or higher high school average, we know that those students would be graduating at or above the average. So we started segmenting the population in the class of 2018 and looking at who came in with lower than a 93 high school average. Um, you'll hear more from Charlie in a few minutes about the male-female split, knowing that at Stony Brook, men graduated at a much lower rate than females. So men became an area that we wanted to put attention on. Another interesting data aspect from uh, issues of research they not only look at obviously GPAs, knowing who might be in the murky middle group that we'd want to focus attention on, but they also looked at in the student's first semester grades at Stony Brook, instead of looking at who earned maybe a D or an F, they looked at who did not earn at least one A or A minus grade. And that was very interesting because we found that if a student did not earn at least one A or A minus in their first semester, their graduation rate was actually only 37% in a four-year rate. So again, all of these pieces allowed us to look student by student and say, do these variables, do these data sets apply to this individual subset of students? And then that allowed us to collapse our list to get to a group of where are we gonna put our effort? Because if you're a school like Stony Brook, we have fairly large high advisor to student ratios. And the challenge with that is trying to give all of our resources, our finite resources to large numbers of students. And the finish in four, the, the, the dedicated advisor piece to finish in four allowed us to put more targeted effort into these students who, again, they, they were kind of on the cusp of if they get more help and support, they're likely going to cross that finish line in, in four years. So again, it's the, it's the gender, the high school GPA, and their first semester grades that allowed us to have a much more impactful um, uh, inter intervention strategy. Um, some other things that we did related to, the, and these may be just some low-hanging fruit things, but we did um, contact every student where the bursar hold. Any student who did not advance register or fully register on time, they received direct outreach. Um, we've done a lot, a lot with text messaging has been a feature as well. And we've also done a lot related to building class identity. So the class of has become a much stronger mantra at Stony Brook. As Charlie had mentioned, it really takes a village and all of us changing this success attitude was really important to, to gain support campus-wide. So, so that covers the, the you know, class advisor in the Finish and Four model. I do want to highlight two other pieces briefly. One of, are these mini grants. Um, we were able to identify some funds so that if there were students for whom there may have been a situation in their last semester or second to last semester, and they didn't have the financial resources to finish their, their studies at Stony Brook and finish in four years, it allowed us an opportunity based on financial need to work closely with our financial aid office and then give mini grants to students so that they would then be able to have the funds to finish that last semester. It was also a strategy for us to look at students who might finish in maybe nine semesters, but if we could get them to finish in a summer and advance their studies slightly, would allow us to bring people into the four-year graduation rate. So being really deliberate in how that money is allocated has allowed, has allowed us, as you can see, 98% of the students who received those funds did in fact finish in four years. So it, every, as we keep saying, every student, it's a one by one student. So every student from we gave money to, we tracked them, made sure they were in the right courses and that really helped us achieve that, that uh, important goal. And the last thing I just wanted to, to highlight briefly, Shelly mentioned this as well, we've done, uh, had a very strong partnership with EAB and EAB Navigate. And so not only do we use the Navigate platform as, as our central advising platform for the campus and many faculty staff, it, it really keeps us in, in um, collaborative communication by using the same platform. This is the student facing uh, platform. So the mobile app called Navigate allows students to have tailored information at their disposal related to reminders, academically related things, financial aid related that are segmented based upon the population that fits with what your needs are. And so it's been another very effective tool. Um, we've had a very high download rate by our students and use of it. So it's another uh, ev example of really good technology that's helped us advance our, our, um, our goals. So let me just move it on to Charlie. I was going to talk in more depth about the gender disparities. 
Thank you, Rick. Um, I just want to go back and mention two things that, that I think are, are critically important. Um, one is, and Rick alluded to this a, a little bit, is, is we really try to create what we call a culture of success. So from the first day that students set foot on campus, and we really hope they will be setting foot on campus again, um, from, from new student orientation, we start talking about um, graduating in four years. We start talking about the importance of that. For our transfer students, we start talking about graduating in a timely basis to in ensure that they can begin the next phase of their lives. We talk to them about the fact that, that they belong there, um, that, that they were selected to, to be a part of our community because we know they have what it takes to be successful. So it's a two-pronged approach. One is to really create a, a, a culture of success within the students. Um, and the student's way of thinking, and the other is, is within our own university and getting people to talk about student success and, and academic success and what that means. The other thing is something that um, Shelley alluded to, and she talks about a lot and I think is, is really important, that everything that we do has to be both intentional and strategic. Um, so that, that really we are um, really examining every step that we take through those lenses to, to really understand what the impact and what the outcome of our actions will be. So let me now um, swivel a little bit and, and come over to talk about the, the, the gender-based graduation disparity. Um, we became aware of this when we started looking at different populations of students and wanting to know who was graduating and, and who was not graduating. And, and one of the groups that, that we identified were those students who identified themselves as, as male. So if you took the cohort of students who came in together, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and our incoming class is about 50% each, and we recognize that there are more than two genders, but in, in, in this case, we're, we're, we're looking at it through, through this lens based on how students identify themselves upon enrollment. Um, and students will start at the same point. You go out four years later. These are first-time, full-time students. You go out four years later, and there was a 17 percentage point gap between the, the, the graduation on-time graduation rate of, of male and female students. So we wanted to, to begin to understand that. So, so we, we created a subcommittee of the academic success team, our, our male completion group, and we conducted what might as well have been called a qualitative study. Um, so we did focus group interviews and individual interviews, very scripted, very guided interviews with, with um, almost 200 male undergraduates, some who were amazingly successful and some who are hanging on by, by their fingertips to begin to understand what these issues were. Um, and then we tried to put interventions in place to begin um, to, to close that gap. And as you can see, we're really proud of the fact that, that this past year the, the completion gap was only 10%. Still too high, still something that we need to lower, but it's the first time that we've really seen some significant movement. Um, and, and so we want to really build upon this and, and try to continue what we've learned and, and, and make a change going forward. So what are the, some of the things that we've learned? And, and I, I know that we're, we're getting um, to the point where we want to start answering some questions, so I'm going to go through this quickly. I'm not going to hit on, on every issue here, but these are, are some of the topics that, that came out of the students themselves. As I said, it was qualitative research. So we really heard from these young men what, what the issues were. Um, and many revolved around issues of, of masculinity. So many revolved around the issue of what's been known as, as toxic masculinity. And you can, you can see on the chart um, what some of those issues are. Continuing um, issues around um, the inability to delay gratification, some of the financial realities, which are different or perceived different for male students than, than women students, and they, they experience them differently. Um, these are students who were very successful before they got to Stony Brook um, and maybe are a little bit less successful now and they don't know how to deal with that, they don't know how to deal with those frustrations. 
Um, these are, again, some of the things that you might think about, alcohol and drug usage. The immersive video games, I want to be clear that it's not all video games, um, but there, there seem to be issues around the immersive video games and issues around poor decision making. Two of the things that I think are, are most important is this question um, that I've asked male undergraduates for a really long time now, which is who's a role model for what it means, what, what I refer to in, in my work as a full-hearted man in the 21st century. Um, it used to be 20th century, but the 21st century. And, and the, the disturbing outcome is that, in fact, they can't think of anybody. So whether it's somebody in their family, whether it's somebody in, in public life, um, public intellectuals, uh, people in pop culture, they really can't come up with anybody. And as a father and a grandfather myself, um, it, it's really disturbing that, that, that you can count on one hand the number who said their own fathers. Now, obviously, a lot of students don't, don't have fathers in their lives, and I understand that. But even those who do um, don't mention that, and, and I find that really disturbing. And one of the things that we've tried to do is to create mentoring relationships and mentoring programs so that these young men will have role models, these young men will have those ideas of what to do. This is an issue that, that, that relates to the poor decision making, and this is something that one of our students raised um, during one of the very, very first focus groups that we had, and it's something that, that um, resonated with the students, and, and so we've continued to raise it in, in focus groups. So if, if there's a student who has an organic chemistry midterm the next morning and they really need to study a lot to, to um, do well on that, or they have the opportunity to, to potentially go out on a date and potentially maybe have a sexual encounter, um, every almost virtually every student in the room um, said that they were going to, to go out on, on the date um, and that many thought they'd be able to study when they got back home. When I pointed out to them that likely they were not going to do well on their orgo exam and in all likelihood they were not going to have a sexual encounter, most of the students still said they would, they would uh, choose, in my value judgment, the wrong choice um, and, and go out and, and move that way. So what have we learned, um, just to wind up now, what, what have we learned? Um, we have found that we've been able to, as I said, achieve a 17-point increase in six years in the on-time graduation rate, and we also are focusing on ensuring that our transfer students equally um, graduate in, in uh, as early a time as possible. That rate of improvement um, puts us in, in the top 3% of four-year institutions within the United States. Um, we're not satisfied with that. We, we are concerned that, that with what's going on right now in this semester that we will probably hit a, uh, a speed bump with that one, but we are prepared to move that further and continue to set a new target and continue to improve our outcomes. Even more significant in so many ways is that we've been able to eliminate most of our equity gaps. Um, that's something that is, is so important to the mission of who we are at Stony Brook, but even more important, so important to the lives and futures of, of all these young people and, and their families and their communities. So we're really proud of, of that. We've, we've put on what we call a full court press. Um, we are trying so many different things all at once, which from a, a research point of view makes it difficult to say this is what works or this is a magic pill because there is no magic pill but we're, we're trying multiple things uh, every single day. We have a commitment from senior leadership, um, which has been really important in, in allowing us to do the work that we do from, from having the contract with EAB to support for our advising mission and, and, and all that we're doing through an investment of hundreds of thousands of dollars each year. And we will um, uh, initiate um, anything that seems to make sense. Um, we will measure it, as Shelley described in the PDSA model. We will see if it does. We don't waste time on things that we try and don't work. Um, but we will continue to try new things, continue to, to, to move forward and, and try to um, move the numbers. What, do we, what have we learned is that none of this is a flash in the pan. Everything 
needs to be sustainable. So because we're able to make a change, and we can't then move on and do other things. We have to move on and do other things while we we're continuing the initial change that, that we put in place. So these things, as, as Shelley would say, are, are, are building a scaffolding and, and, and really building upon a, a firm foundation. As, as I just said, there's no magic bullet. Um, it's really a, a combination of all of these things coming together. Um, it's a story of, of a thousand and one initiatives. Um, and it's hard to tell this story um, because people are looking for that magic bullet and, and we don't have it. And then finally, we know that the answer is, is high tech and high touch. So we need to use the technology, we use the data, but it will not replace advising, it will not replace student affairs, it will not replace the, the relationships that are so key to students uh, having a successful outcome. And with that, I'm gonna stop and um, then we're going to turn it over to, to Todd and open it up for questions. Thanks so much, Charlie, Shelley, and Rick. Uh, great presentation. Uh, enjoyed hearing the, the Stony Brook story. Um, quick note to all the attendees. Um, we, we've experienced some webinar platform instability um, that we believe is due to heavy usage or something else. Um, the platform provider uh, is working to correct the issue. I've noticed some of you have kind of logged on, off and logged back in. Um, but we really thank, thank you for your understanding as we're managing through this. Um, we do have several um, questions that have been posed to the, uh, to the uh, presenters. And so with the remaining time that we have, about uh, 10, 15 minutes, um, I'll be able to ask these questions to our panelists and we'll, we'll see what, how they respond. Um, so the first question, um, I think I pose this to, to Rick. Um, you mentioned using text messaging to do direct contact with at-risk students. How do you ensure that you have the correct information for a cell phone, and what FERPA implications do you consider? Sure, and that, that's a good question. So, um, so we do have, as I'm sure all campuses do, an alert system anyway in terms of a, a messaging, so should there be an emergency? So we use that same information, um, but students are aware in terms of allowing, uh, being allowed to opt out if they don't want to receive that messaging. Um, we've not received much pushback from students on it, but and I will say it's used on a very limited basis. But we have found that effective not only for things like reminding people of, of appointments, whether it's with their uh, counseling center, academic advisor, as ways to really get um, reduce no-show rates. So that's been effective as, as well. So um, you know, again, maybe Shelly and Charlie can add to it as well. But you know, very little pushback. I think it's just kind of good, good, quick reminders for students. It's been helpful to us. I'll add one thing actually just to that because I, I had mentioned when I was talking about the strategies about uh, uh, some policy form around expectations for enrollment and so we have an advanced registration period where students can register for for a uh, they have an appointment date and time and this is different than some institutions um, but they can still continue to register right all the way up through you know uh, essentially the start of classes uh, but what we were using the text messages for is really trying to get students to enroll during their enrollment appointment date so that we could move forward with assisting them as far as their enrollment and uh, you know and, uh, and and getting better information about whether they were making degree progress and so we actually were texting students the night before their enrollment appointment to let them know so broad-scale texting saying your enrollment appointment is tomorrow you need to register at this time um, and we found a significant amount of success with that Great. Um, uh, next question uh, I'll aim to Charlie. Um, is faculty professional development or professional learning a part of the things tried by Stony Brook, and what did it look like? Engaging faculty, I think, is, is critically important, but um, not always an, an easy task. Um, we had some initial faculty who joined us at, at the academic success meetings. Um, but 7.30 in the morning didn't seem to work for them and, and uh, there wasn't consistent involvement um, in the meeting. So what we've done is, is to try to take the message to faculty. Um, so we've just recently done a, a large presentation for our, our faculty senate, our, our uh, shared governance body um, for the university that got a lot of interest and got a lot of faculty um, curious about what we're doing and reaching out to, to see how they can get involved. We've had the opportunity to, um, we have what, what's called the Undergraduate Program Directors Group and we meet once a month 
and we've made student success a, a uh, an issue of priority uh, at those meetings so that, that uh, faculty um, that are leading the undergraduate uh, programs in each of the academic departments can bring this back to, to their area uh, and talk to faculty about it. We've also worked with, with our, our academic colleges and schools, uh, dean's offices to be able to speak at chairs meetings and, and other venues like that to begin to talk about academic success. But I think for us that is really um, working with, with engaging faculty more and, and impacting the, the actual curriculum itself um, around success measures is I think our, our next frontier and, and what we need to, um, to tackle next uh, moving forward. Great, thanks Charlie. Um, next question for Rick. Uh, th that was interesting about incentives. How, how were the mini grants obtained? And what was the amount for each student and frequency given? Sure. So, so the money for these mini grants is actually through a SUNY for State University of New York, what's called the uh, Performance Improvement Fund, that the university received for a period of five years. And that funding allowed us to give, again, they, they're typically smaller dollar amounts, and they were only given in the case of somebody, again, had to be at Stony Brook for basically seven consecutive terms and show that their ability to graduate in eight semesters. So the frequency was really only one semester, meaning that last spring semester. Sometimes it extended into the summer to give students funding because you can still be counted within the four-year rate as long as you graduate by August. Um, and so there was an application process where a student would work with the advisor to do that, and then it would be reviewed in consultation with financial aid because we'd want to make sure the student had true demonstrated need that they'd maybe max out on loans or other things where we knew based upon the FAFSA and other, and other evidence that, that, the, that the grant was really necessary. And then we monitored to make sure that the courses the student enrolled in were in fact what they needed to graduate. And so that's why we're able to achieve the 98% rate because it all had to be in alignment to make sure that they were in the right courses, they got the money, and then they did well. So even as Shelly mentioned with the tutoring center, often we link students up if we had some concerns because we wanted to make sure if they got that grant money, they were going to finish in four. Thanks, Rick. Uh, Shelly, uh, when you say student-centric, do you put the student desires first or student learning and career readiness first? So, uh, so I, I will answer this, but then if Charlie wants to jump in, because I've heard him actually talk quite a bit about this at Academic Success Team, but, um, but I think that's a great question, and I, I think the way that we have always talked about it has really been related to a balance. Um, so when we talk about finish in four, uh, there are really positive implications of a student moving through um, you know, their degree uh, on time. Um, but that is not necessarily true for all students, and I think we have to be really sensitive to what uh, the student situation is, the student goals, and, and that's why we often talk about the one student at a time, uh, individualized attention, but at scale, right? So that's usually how we, how we have to talk about it because we are doing things at scale for an entire undergraduate population with a very um, acute understanding that student situations are not always the same. Uh, and so we, when we talk about being student-centered, um, we want students to move through on time. We want to support them in what their goals are. It's often the case that student goals align with that, um, but they don't either have um, the kind of college knowledge uh, that they need or they're facing different kinds of barriers that are impeding that progress. And so what we try to do is, is really assess what it is that the student wants and needs, and then put some things in place, scaffold, right, as Charlie mentioned, really create some scaffolding to allow the student to move through that. So it really does have to be a balance um, with what we know are, are good outcomes for students, but also supporting um, what the student situation is. And finishing in four may not necessarily be right for every student, um, but we also know that there are positive outcomes associated with it. Charlie, did you want to add anything? Sure, I, I didn't want to jump in on her. But, um, the one thing I would say, and in, in, I agree with absolutely everything Shelly said, the other piece of this is that, you know, when, when we come up with our policies, when we come up with our practices, sometimes they just become institutionalized. And often um, the processes are designed for, for the professional's convenience. 
um, whether that's staff or faculty, um, or are designed because this is the way it was when we were in school and this is what makes sense to us, um, rather than looking at it through the student lens. From a student perspective, is this really the, the best way to, to do something? Is this the best way to expect them to, to behave in, in order for them to be successful? So it's a combination of, of both factors, I think. Thanks. Uh, and Charlie, maybe you can answer uh, this and then invite um, Rick and, and Shelley to add. Um, broad question, how do you effectively co collaborate with other departments on campus? What are some recommendations to help folks get out of their silo? So um, that's a great question and, and a really important one. So I think um, there are a couple of things that I will say to that. One is, is uh, to invite them to the table. Um, and often, uh, and I know historically, we haven't invited everybody to the table um, to see what's going on, to understand what the issues are, to understand the impact that we're having on, on students. We have a, a new um, interim chief information officer now, um, and he's come to our meetings and, and, and really learned what we're doing and has now required each of his senior staff to, to rotate through the, the Wednesday morning meetings to get a better sense of, of what's going on. Um, and we've had people from a variety of departments come speak with us, do presentations with us. We'll bring the show on the road to other departments um, and, and to really try to be as visible and communicative as, as you can. The other thing that, that I think makes a difference, and I think Rick alluded to this, was through the Navigate platform, um, all of the student-facing departments can um, put notes in the same um, platform so that we can all see what's going on in, e in each other's area. We can get a, a real full 360 understanding of what's happening with, with the students. Uh, and I think that's, that, that, that colleagues from other parts of the institution then can gain an appreciation for what we're doing and what's going on so that, that um, they're, they're eager to become a part of the, the student success work. And can I, can I jump in with just one of the things? I wanted to mention that, um, you know, I know Charlie alluded to this before, but, you know, Stony Brook's been recognized, obviously, not only for the graduation right now, but also the socioeconomic mobility of our student body. And I think in the end, you know, it takes a champion like Charlie, our, the leadership of the institution, to move the agenda forward. But I also think we, with the work that's been done, there have been accomplishments. And so that momentum is what makes other people want to join in. So I just think having, if you can build your graduation rate, even pieces at a time, little bits at a time, you build that momentum. I think people want to be part of a, of a, good, of a good story. And so even if there are some, the champions behind the cause and you can move in, in a positive direction, I think you'll get more people to join the cause. Thanks, Rick. Um, maybe, Rick, if you can uh, uh, answer this question as well. Um, uh, one of the attendees is curious uh, if you have similar outcomes with transfer students as well as first-time, full-time freshmen. Yeah, you know, and, I, and I think this is, this is definitely a group, group answer on this. Um, it, mm -hmm. my, in my prior work, I worked a lot with transfer students, more directly in the advising realm. That certainly is a population that we put, provide a lot of support to. Um, but but it, it's, it's challenging because there are limited resources. And so given the resources that we, that we do have and knowing that first-year students generally come at the same place, it's easier to kind of move that, that group along the same path. Transfer students, as I'm sure most people on this call know, that they all come at, in at different points in terms of where their academic needs are, in terms of credits, in terms of skill level, in terms of the majors of interest. So it's a little bit of a harder group to kind of work, work with. Um, in terms of helping them achieve their goals. But a lot has been done around the orientation space to provide a better onboarding experience for, for that group and then help them through. And maybe Shelly and Charlie can talk more about that. I mean, I would just add it related to advising. I mean, I think that, um, you know, I think that there's been a different kind of attention and more attention uh, from advising to transfer students, obviously different than uh, than our FTFT population, uh, but the connection related to advising and some of the things that they've been doing uh, related to their own um, uh, workshop opportunities for transfer students, engaging transfers, particularly with uh, the major departments, engaging them around uh, uh, 
skill-based and career-based uh, workshopping. So really trying to understand and tap into the needs of transfer students through our advising uh, um, offices has been has been really important. And I'll just add to that and, and build upon that. The other thing is is that we're now talking about it, and I think I think um, there was a lot of attention at universities um, on first-time, full-time students for a very long time, and, and we uh, all invested a lot of money in, in first-year programs of one sort or the other. And I think now um, we talk about, about transfer students. We talk about the importance of transfer students to the university and, and our commitment to transfer students and, and really ensuring that they have both a quality experience but, but also are able to um, take advantage of the credits that they have and, and graduate in a timely way, prepared for the next stage of, of their lives. Thanks. Um, Charlie, can you, can you elaborate on some of the policies or protocols, administrative or otherwise, that Stony Brook changed as a result of the success team's review? Sure. So, and, and Shelley mentioned some of them already, but, you know, whether it's, um, in terms of expectations around how many credits a student will carry each semester. Um, so we work really hard now to ensure that, that students carry a full load, um, that they carry at least 15 credits. Um, it's important for a lot of reasons, including uh, financial aid reasons in New York State, but it's, it's also important um, that they make degree progress each and every semester and that they're taking um, what's referred to as degree applicable credits. As, as Shelley indicated, the, the policy around um, course registration or registration for the following semester and how long that remains open and, and, and what we do with that. We walked back some of our policies around students on academic warning. Um, so we've tightened that a little bit um, rather than um, giving students a, a longer time um, we've shortened that because we believe that we can use that shortened time in a focused way to help students get back on track. Um, and as Shelley said, Brett, we were focusing a lot on, on students with below a 2.0. Um, and while we're still obviously focusing on them, we're also putting a, a lot of uh, focus on students in that 2.0 who are technically in good standing to 2.5. Um, so that, that we've shifted our resources and, and, and shifted our, our, our way of, of trying to address those needs. Thanks, Charlie. Um, we might only have a chance for maybe one more question. Um, here's a big one, uh, and I'll maybe direct it at Shelley. Um, Shelley, would, would you be able to share the strategies, whether they're academic, pedagogical, or, or advising, that you've used to close equity gaps? So I'm gonna I'm gonna ask Charlie to answer that. But what I will say about that is that um, that many of our strategies. So when we look at the the slide that I had put up related to the uh, multi pronged approach, the strategies that we engaged in, um, these were really the strategies that we employed uh, for all students. But I think what you often see is that there's a compensatory effect um, for students uh, that that are from disadvantaged identities or disadvantaged backgrounds. Um, I, would, I will say that um, we have done a lot of work um, related to, uh, particularly around the Finish in Four with the fund um, in terms of uh, income barriers. Um, and I think Charlie can probably talk a little bit about our EOP program, our, our educational opportunity program that, that has also really been instrumental related to some of the equity gaps. So I'm gonna turn it over to Charlie just to mention uh, our EOP program in particular. So uh, our the EOP AIM program is a program that admits students who um, come from the lowest socioeconomic strata, but also um, are less academically prepared than than students admitted through the the, the typical channels to Stony Brook. Um, and we start with them in a, a summer program and and really build, which we're not going to be able to do this year. Um, and, and have incredible success with them. Um, one of the students that I'm really close to now is a first-generation um, uh, parents were immigrants student, came from a, a rather difficult high school in, in the Bronx, New York, 
um, came to Stony Brook and, and became a, a chemistry major. He's in the EOP program. He graduated our undergraduate program in three years, um, is now this semester completing a master's in chemistry and has been admitted to the Yale PhD program in chemistry. Um, those are the stories, and Rick talked about that su success breeds success, and it does. Um, those are the stories that, that we are, are incredibly proud of, and, and there are so many stories, um, so many students that we've been able to focus on and, and to help faculty become more sensitive to and, and understand what the needs are and what the issues are to, to really ensure um, success for all of our students. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. That, what a wonderful way to, to wrap up the uh, webcast. So um, I want to thank you, Charlie, Shelley, and Rick uh, for sharing your insights. And thank you to our audience for attending. And, and we really do appreciate your patience with the webinar platform performance. Um, it seemed to have gotten a little more stable towards the end. So thank you for that. Um, please remember, um, the archived recording of the webinar will be emailed to you today or tomorrow. And I just wish that uh, all of you are safe and, and be well. Stay healthy. Thank you for attending. Bye-bye.